So we're on a field trip today. We are at Stone Lick Lake, Claremont County, Ohio. Um, we're going to show you a different ecosystem. We're going to go kayaking today, but I wanted to introduce the lake a little bit. Um, very pretty lake, uh, 150 acres of uh, uh, pool area. Uh, it was created, the dam was built in 1950, and it was created as a recreational lake. It was not created to do any stormwater retention or anything like that. So the, the pool depth is pretty constant. We'll show you the, the dam. They don't really even have any way, it appears to me, in my untrained eye, uh, to adjust the, the pool level uh, from the dam. So by having a, a very stable um, pool level, you notice that it's always the same. So the, eco, the ecosystem in that, that, uh, that edge area knows what should be there. It's always saturated soils, uh, so there's a, there's a very diverse ecosystem growing along the edge of it. It's not like some uh, detention lakes where they, they fluctuate the water level depending on uh, the season or expected rain levels where you'll have a big dead area. Uh, so it, it just makes it a very pretty lake. So we're going to enjoy going out and uh, exploring a little bit. So the dam is set at a certain pool level. And that keeps it constant throughout the lake, which means that the area that we're going to be kayaking today is constantly underwater. It doesn't drain down, and sometimes it's dry, and sometimes it's flooded. Uh, so it, it really impacts the, uh, uh, the flora and the fauna that live there. So we've driven along, along the west side of the lake from the dam, along 727, to the entrance of this area, which I would, I'm just going to call this a canoe launch area. We passed the boat launch, which is a separate area, it's a much broader area, which takes you out to the, the main lake. The main lake is nice kayaking too, but that's just not what we're going to do today. We'll do another video on kayaking out at the lake. Then you also pass by several other inlets, including a small cemetery, and then we're basically outside the small hamlet of, of Edenton. So if, as you're coming in from the dam, there's a green sign that announces that you're in Edenton, and this is the driveway that comes in from uh, near that sign. So we can scan along, and you can see why we find this to be just the most picturesque area. This is, this is the old Stone Lick Creek. It is now part of the lake, even though it's pretty narrow, but you can imagine that as you dam up the creek, the water level fills up and it seeks this pool level, and it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and we're going to head upstream uh, and, and kind of show where it, it, uh, it joins up with the actual creek itself. So before we get on the water, uh, there's some things just along the edge that are kind of, it's kind of a nice opportunity to talk about. We've got sandbar willow, obviously a, a common thing along creeks here. Down here there's this beautiful patch of uh, fog fruit that has this cute little flower in it. We have next to it here, much bigger, we have giant ragweed. Giant ragweed, here's one of the those things that cause you problems with your hay fever. You can see the fog fruit is just forming a carpet through here. We've got some honeysuckle. In here, we have false nettle, which we just talked about in our video last week in our, our woodland walk, false nettle. Uh, it's a nettle, but it obviously doesn't have uh, the stingers because I can I can touch it there. As we get closer to the water, you get the the obligate wetland plants. So reaching out into the water in a carpet all along this shoreline, and you can see it. There's almost an island of it over there. Is primrose willow. Uh, I would love to tell you specifically what species it is, although it's really complicated genetics. Uh, primrose willow uh, 
forms all sorts of different hybrids and it's very difficult to, to differentiate, or it is for me at any rate. So we'll stick with primrose willow. Pretty flower. It's an introduced uh, invasive weed, unfortunately. Right next to it you can see this tall arrow-shaped leaf here. Um, this is broad-leafed arrowhead. This beautiful patch here is pickerel weed. Pickle reed, if you can get in close to this flower, um, it's just beautiful. Pickle, pickerel weed actually will form seeds that are edible. Um, they're they're nut-like. You can eat them fresh or you can roast them up. The the fresh or the small leaves of pickerel weed are also edible. Let's continue to look over here more. Here's the broadleaf arrowhead bloom. You can see it setting fruit here. And here it is in bloom. We're just going to continue along the shoreline before we get in the water and, and look at some things. We have Queen Anne's Lace. Queen Anne's Lace is an upland plant, so it's, it's, it happens to be drier here. It's kind of unusual to see that right here. Queen Anne's Lace has this white umbel. Growing behind the Queen Anne's Lace is a um, swamp rose, Rosa palustris. You can see it's got five leaflets. It has a stipule that has just two sharp points and then it's just like a like a leaf along there. Um, that's a native rose, uh, unlike our non-native multiflora rose where that stipule would be very feathery. Let's continue to walk over here by the water. So it's always good refresher to talk about poison ivy. Poison ivy, leaves of three, let it be, you know, reddish stem, very irregular toothed. You can see here it has a lobe over on this side, it's a lobe over on that side. There's poison ivy. There's a whole uh, group of it along the the, sh um, the edge of the, the grasslands here. So we were talking about the swamp rose over there and I compared it to multiflora rose. Here's multiflora rose which you can, uh, if you can look at there, I'll, I'll put in some better pictures, but the stipules are very feathery and uh, all of the native roses, none of the native roses have these feathery stipules. Just pull that off and we can, I don't know if it... Also along the bank, pretty common, is what I think is one of the prettiest flowers. This American water willow. This little purpley flower here. Comes up in pairs like that. Um, has very strap-shaped leaves. Uh, and you'll find it right on the edge of the water. It'll grow it into the water. So off in the distance, you'll see spotted along this, this shoreline, these pink and dark red flowers that look a lot like a hibiscus flower. That's because this is a hibiscus. This is probably the northernmost hibiscus that I know of. It's a native plant. Uh, it's a swamp rose mallow. And I think of hibiscus as being a, a tropical plant. Uh, it, so it's really wild to see it growing here along the shoreline. Uh, very pretty. Also, this is one of the few wetland shrubby plants here. This is button bush. You can see it has these flowers, just amazing little, they look, I don't know, like little stars exploding or something like that. Um, very pretty. Uh, we often see butterflies landing on the, the button bush. So the last time, few times we've been out here uh, planning on going kayaking, we've been in this situation where we've been standing here wondering whether the weather is going to allow us to go out. Uh, we had a huge thunderstorm the last time we came out. Uh, this time we just had a big rainstorm. We're wondering whether or not it's a, a good idea to go out. So, um, but what a beautiful place to stand as we're wondering. If you look down here, you can see there's a, probably you can't see because it's pretty small, but just take my word for it. There's a great blue heron in the shallows uh, looking for food. And then as you scroll along the shoreline, 
over here at the end of this little sandbar is a great egret, the white bird here, who's also looking for things to eat among the, uh, the plant, plant life. Someplace along there, there's at least a couple families of wood ducks that we've watched hatch out and the young are around and now they're younger looking about the same size as the adults. Uh, wood ducks are just so cool to watch. They're just, the adult males are fun because they're so colorful. The sound that they make is just unearthly. It, it just takes you to a, another place in time. It's, it's fun to listen to. And then the last time we were kayaking, we're kayaking down the, the, the river, actually up the river, and behind us we hear the water splash. And we think, wow, that was a big fish. That's pretty cool. And then as we're going along, as we're coming back, we see a head swimming along in the water, and we realize that we're following a beaver. Julie is following this one beaver who's getting closer and closer and closer, and at the last minute he slaps his tail and disappears beneath the water and swims off. Very cool. If we, if we look over here behind the great blue heron, you can just make out there's a fence line there. And you can see where there, you could, there used to be like an inlet over there. It's pretty filled in. Behind the trees over there, you can't see it from here, is the sewage treatment plant for the Stonelick State Park campground. So the effluent from the sewage treatment plant dumps out into the creek here, or into the lake, because it's been flooded, so into the lake. Uh, so that's a potential for contamination, particularly after a rainstorm. I'm a little uncomfortable swimming in the lake. The, uh, the lake is very shallow. There's a lot of sediment that washes in off of the hillsides, and as pretty much any dammed lake, uh, it, it holds that sediment. Comes in, there's a, a pool area, the water settles, or the water um, stills, and sediment that's being carried settles down to the bottom, so it tends to fill in. Well, it looks like the weather has cleared up a little bit. We still have some dark skies, but that makes for some beautiful light. It's a beautiful night out here. Hopefully we'll see some good things. So we came over here by this swamp rose mallow, which as you look at it more closely, you can definitely see looks just like a hibiscus. Has this wonderful center here. Comes in all these different colors. So they actually have hybridized this with other hibiscus. Hibisci? I don't know how that works. Um, because the swamp hibiscus it survives further north so trying to get some of the the more uh, subtropical hibiscus to uh, survive further north they will hybridize it with the swamp hibiscus um, which has worked somewhat kind of an interesting idea I don't know if you can see scattered through here are cattails the cattail the bloom here you can see it, the, the top part, the staminate or male flower, is falling apart. The bottom part is the female or pistillate flower. Um, it's a whole clust, cluster of flowers, but the, the hot dog-like part is all the, the uh, female flowers, and then the part that's kind of ragged up at the top because it's spent is the male flowers. When you look at this and you see the broad leaves, and then you see the staminate flowers coming down and touching the pistillate flowers. There's no gap in between. That's because this is, this is our native broadleaf cattail. It's not nearly as aggressive as the narrowleaf cattail that uh, causes so much problems in wetlands. There's also a hybrid between the broadleaf and the narrowleaf, which also causes tremendous problems. Uh, in general, and you can't say this all the time, but in general, if you can't see that, that space between the two, um, that's an indication that it's the broadleaf and it's the, it's the native. So the other indication that this is the native cattail is if you look at the habitat that it's in, there's a lot of other things. There's a, a huge diversity of other plants that are growing in and among the other cattails. The native cattails generally are not as aggressive and they allow this kind of diversity. The non-native aggressive 
cattails um, reproduce just by um, underground means and they tend to form really dense colonies and exclude everything else. So along the shorelines here is this very pretty plant which is unfortunately very invasive and uh, not something that we really want to see. This is purple loosestrife. Purple loosestrife uh, will definitely take over a wetland area um, and to the exclusion of everything else. So it's really important to get rid of these things. I don't have any way of getting rid of this here right now. Otherwise, we would do something with it. We really don't have permission to, to be doing um, maintaining this area here. But, uh, but good stewards would, would take out this plant. So here's a plant that makes itself known from a long way away. You know, everything else is green around here. And then here's this tangle of plant life that's kind of orangish yellow. This is uh, the parasitic plant dotter. There's a number of species of dotter. And to be honest, I, I can't tell, the, tell them apart. Um, there's very little to go on because there's hardly any leaves. The leaves are very small. They've been reduced to almost nothing. Uh, dotter is parasitic, so it, it's growing off of a host plant and it's taking its nourishment from the host plant. Uh, so it definitely can, can harm the host plant. It's still kind of a cool plant. It produces a flower, uh, produces seeds. The seeds go out and uh, will germinate and then sends out roots that actually will be rooted until it can find a host plant to, to grab onto. It actually will find its host plant based on chemicals that the plants, the host plant is putting out. It can, it can, in a sense, smell the host plant and it will choose the host plant that it wants to, uh, to attach to. So we're coming up towards the end of the, the lake portion of this kayak trip. Uh, this is the bridge on 131, which crosses over East Fork Creek or East Fork Lake, depending on how you want to look at this. Um, this is still, still water, so technically it is still part of the lake. So we are traveling upstream from the 131 bridge. We can still hear the traffic on the 131 bridge behind us. Uh, there's kind of two intersections. There's first one that we come to has a little dead end stream off to the the right. Um, so this is the second stream and it's much more major. Um, and you can see it. there's a, a, a fork here. The left fork goes to Locust Creek and the right fork that we're going to follow a little bit here is actually Stone Lick Creek. So we are still in the still water area of the lake. So technically we are still on the lake even though it's very narrow here. But it's still, the water level here is controlled by the dam. So it's, uh, it's considered the lake. So we're going to head on down and see if we can find where the, the creek starts and the lake ends. Well, I think we've gone just about as far as we can. I assume that it still seems like lake to me. We're still on flat water. I'm sure the creek starts a little bit further on, but uh, it's basically impenetrable with all these logs down. But uh, it was a beautiful trip. We enjoyed it. As Julie was just saying, the nice thing about this is you've got... Uh, it's like river rafting or river kayaking uh, because you've got so much to see on both sides but it's basically flat water, so you can kayak up and you can kayak down, and it's very leisurely. Well, we had a good time today. I hope you did too. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please like the video. If you want to see more of it, please subscribe. Uh, we'll hopefully do more videos, maybe other kayak trips around uh, the county, other places that we like to go. Uh, I think I kind of like the idea of doing these field trips. So, thanks for watching.